I want to look at is what sort of government regulations might there be that would affect us over the, you know, the near term and out to 15 years. So we just kind of went through this. You've seen some of this before, probably. Um, <clears throat> PERPA, which is the Public Utility Regulatory Policies Act, was the act that was set up uh, to kind of drive a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> and the thing that, that really was potentially beneficial for some of the co-ops was the idea of qualified facilities where you would be required to buy that energy from the QF, uh, even if it went over the 5%. But when we start looking at that, there's uh, a bunch of people who are essentially trying to get that law changed in various ways. So you can see that Tri-State and the energy industry trade groups, including the NRECA, are trying to make some changes, uh, either with changes at, at the congressional level, where the law is changed, or more likely through FERC filings with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So they're trying to eliminate the avoided cost methodology, which determines you know, how much would have to be paid. They're trying to eliminate the single meter rule, um, <clears throat> limiting contract terms to shorter lengths, and then uh, <clears throat> reducing the size of projects that would qualify. That last one probably doesn't affect us much. I can't imagine that we would do 20 megawatt projects locally in any case. <clears throat> but there's... Uh, all of that going on, and of course there's the tri-state appeal to FERC that we've talked about that's been hanging out there now, I guess for a couple of years, uh, <clears throat> where tri-state lost the ruling to FERC. FERC agreed that tri-state had to allow the co-ops to buy <clears throat> uh, from QFs, but they've appealed it and nothing has happened. <clears throat> so essentially, you know, what, what I would say about that is that it's in such flux at this point I don't think there's any chance at all that QFs start to play into the uh, <clears throat> equation anytime in the, in the near future now. And, and I have no idea what's going to come out of that as to whether that might be a factor later on. Retail choice. This has happened in a bunch of other places around the country. Um, so basically what that means <coughs> is that a customer gets to buy from whoever they want that supplies energy, not necessarily the local utility. So I was in Houston when they did this in Texas, and so HLMP, which was Houston Lighting and Power, basically formed sort of two arms. One was the, the utility, wires, poles, all that sort of stuff, and the other was a, a retail marketing arm. But then there were 15 or 20 other companies that came in and said, we want to sell energy. So they would use HLMP's facilities, but the customer would choose which one they wanted to buy from. And there were all these different plants. You could buy green energy, you could buy you know, whatever you wanted. So there's been some talk about trying to do this in Colorado, and we thought, you know, we really ought to look at what the implications would be. So it could potentially have major implications for LPEA, depending on how the law was written. So for instance, if they came in and said, all right, we're going to allow all these companies to supply energy, LPA, you have to take the energy that they supply and send it through and bill the customer and then pay back to the retail uh, company. <clears throat> that might allow us to become a wires only company if we wanted to do that. And the advantage to that would be that we would no longer be buying from Tri-State and selling to people and that, so that part of it would kind of go away. Now, I don't know if we would want to do that or not, but you know, it's, it's something that could potentially happen. Granted, if it was regular regulations, would we have a choice? I think you can say, no, sorry, we're not going to follow that, or you well, can follow that to be exempt. Right, and so that's why we say it depends on what the law actually said at that point. If the law said, and, and Mike has talked about this in some of our previous meetings, you know, we might want to lobby to, to have the co-ops have an exclusion from this to where we could say, we don't want to allow retail choice in our area. <clears throat> but it's something that has been on the radar and so that's why I said in the third bullet, we may want to get involved in lobbying if and when retail choice starts to move forward. And we would need to decide what do we want to lobby for. Um, and there's about a dozen states right now that have some sort of retail choice. Um, so again, it's just something that we need to be aware of, and it could have a major impact on us depending on how that law is written. Renewable energy standard, we've talked about that some now, we know what it is. <clears throat> Um, the question is, you know, is the state going to start pushing those numbers up? And I think from what I've seen, there's a fair amount of <clears throat> momentum 
you know, depending on elections and all that sort of stuff, to, to push the renewable energy standards up. And so the question then becomes, how would that be handled? Would we be responsible for doing something about that? Would Tri-State be responsible for handling it the way we are now? Or would there be some other thing? Um, so the, the only thing I would say there is, I think it's likely that the renewable energy standard numbers will get pushed up because of the you know, people that are pushing for more and more renewables. Some of the governor candidates are wanting you know 100% renewables by 2035 or 2040. So if you just look at the politics right now, I think it's likely those will get pushed up, and it's something we just need to keep in mind. Um, so this is this is actually shows the renewable energy standard for investor-owned utilities, which is the top line, is much higher than it is for co-ops. So the green line is the co-ops, and we're sitting here at the 6% right now, and we're going to go up to 10% in 2020. But you can see the investor-owned utilities are going to go up to 30% requirement for renewables. So it's likely, I think, that it, it may go up faster than that for the co-ops because we've gotten this you know, number that's so much lower than what the investor-owned utilities are, are pushing for. Um, and, you know, this, again, that's, that's our 5% limit on the red line. And the green line is showing just the current law, so it's going to push up again above what we've got from Tri-State, what we have available from Tri-State. Another thing that uh, we can talk about right now is photovoltaic import tariffs. So the Trump administration put a 30% import tariff on photovoltaic panels uh, this year. And the tariff declines 5% each year and ends after four years. So it's just a four-year tariff. <clears throat> but it starts at 30%, which is what it's at right now, and goes to 25, 20, 15, and then goes off. <clears throat> so we know that in from talking to the installers uh, and people and just reading things, that that's having a negative impact on solar installations right now <clears throat> because it's driven the price up. That doesn't mean that the price has gone up 30% on the whole system because the, tariff, the panels themselves are probably only about half the cost of putting in a system. And there's also some people that are trying to do things to keep that down. So some of the manufacturers have lowered their prices to try to <clears throat> offset some of the tariffs. And so we think that it would probably uh, drive the cost of a system up you know, somewhere in the 500 to 800 dollar range depending on the system size, maybe a little bit more. Um, and you can see there's a note there at the bottom. Uh, again, you know, China, China is where most of these panels are coming from. So what they do, you know, to kind of offset what the tariffs has can have a big impact. And so, you know, Bloomberg New Energy is predicting a pretty substantial decline uh, just in the PV prices. <coughs> And then you know you add the tariff back onto that. Anyway, at the moment that's having some effect. Whether that tariff would remain in place, who knows? I mean that's all. All of these tariffs have been sort of up and down. This trade war kind of talk and so on. David, is the de decline predicted on imported panels or uh, our panels made here in this country, or both? Well, I think, I think probably both. <clears throat> Essentially, in order for the panels that are made here to be competitive, they've got to you know, follow the price in, in the market. So it's, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, obviously the tariffs drive up the imported panels relative to the ones that are here, but from everything I've read, what the manufacturers that are manufactured here have done is push their prices up <clears throat> because now they have this extra room here and, and what they need is more profit. <clears throat> So it's a kind of a complicated situation. Yeah, when I'm, and maybe Laurie or Chris can speak to this too, but when I've talked to people about some of our solar um, folks here locally and others that we, it, it's not black and white. There is, there's still the, the, the market price that you're going with, but, so, but panels are not the only part of the installation of solar on roofs. There's other equipment that in, in itself is also decreasing in price that's lowering the market value. So that's all that's driving the prices lower, just not the solar panels. So the solar panels are really a, 
um, kind of a smoke screen because of the lowering costs of the you know, other equipment involved. Yeah, although the aluminum and steel tariffs, <laughs> you know, driving some of the prices for some of the other parts up. So it's 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 a pretty complicated thing. Um, but you know, people ought to at least be aware of it that you know we may in fact see a decrease in solar installations or not, depending on what the installers can do and you know what people decide they can do. Um, so anyway, it's it's coming down. So it starts to roll off. I think that should be 25. I thought there was 25 percent instead of 26. But anyway, um, so I, again, that's that's a four-year deal. And when we when I show you some some information here a little bit later, that I'm taking that into account. But just understand. Oh wait. Okay, I'm back to the investment tax credit. So. There's a 30% investment tax credit on solar installations right now, and it'll start to roll back after 2019. So that's a B. So if you put in solar, whether it's commercial or rooftop or whatever, assuming that you, uh, your taxes will allow you to do it, you can take 30% of that as a credit on your income taxes. So that basically lowers the cost of the solar system, including batteries, that was ruled not too long ago, by 30%. So you pay X, and then eventually, you know, you're paying 30% less than that. And that's a, that's a federal tax credit. So it's in place. It does start to roll off after 2019. <clears throat> drops to 26%, 2020, 20, 22, 10, and then 10% thereafter. And again, we don't know what's going to happen there. That's something that the Congress could say, yeah, you know, that's enough of that. <clears throat> and it could drop to zero. Um, so as it starts to drop off, that could also have a negative effect on solar installations. But the fact that it's rolling off somewhat gradually probably means there's nothing that's going to happen there really quickly. And of course, the effect is reduced if the PV installation costs continue to decline. So again, you've got these tariffs on the panels that are going to decline. You've got this investment tax credit that's going to decline. And so you know, all these things, all these forces are kind of playing against one another. Have you charted those on the on the same piece of paper? No. And so the other thing that we looked at was what would happen if there was a carbon fee put in. And the whole purpose of a carbon fee is to re make fossil fuel more expensive, so that the economics would cause people to use less of it. That's that's the whole idea. And there is bipartisan support for a fossil fuel. I don't think that, there, that it's likely it'll pass anytime soon because there's not enough support in the Congress to put something like that in. But the idea would be that there would be this fee on fossil fuels, coal, natural gas, uh, crude, all of that sort of stuff. And then at some point, whether it's monthly or, or yearly, they would give all that money back to the people, just spread out evenly. So if you were somebody who was using less than the average amount of fossil fuels, you would get money back. You would get more than you spent on the additional stuff. If you're somebody who used a lot of fossil fuels, you would get less back. So you can see, again, this is, a, this is an attempt to basically use the market to drive the price up on fossil fuels and therefore drive the usage down. So again, you know, I don't know, and, and some of the numbers I've seen could potentially make the fossil fuel lots more expensive. I mean, we're talking big numbers here. So that would, I mean, if you start adding a 10 or 20 or 30 percent carbon fee, that would drive those prices up. And obviously, since Tri-State gets 60 percent of their energy, 70 percent of their energy from coal and natural gas, that could potentially drive the cost of Tri-State's energy way up. So again, it's something that I don't think is going to happen right away, but could easily happen in the next 15 years, and we would definitely need to keep an eye on that. Um, just a few other things. The City of Durango Franchise Agreement expires in 2032, and I was told by Dick White, when he was still the mayor, that it was highly unlikely that the city would renew that franchise agreement if LPEA's rates were not competitive at that time. So 
So again, that's that's kind of out of the edge of our 15-year window that we're looking at, but something to keep in mind. Um, virtual net metering is essentially a system where, you know, right now we've got net metering as long as the generation is on the same <coughs> piece of property behind the same meter. But in California, what they allow you to do, let's say you're a rancher and you've got a need for <coughs> energy over here, but you've got another piece of land over here that you'd like to generate on, even though they're not behind the same meter, they allow you to do virtual net metering, which says, okay, we're going to count what you're generating over here against what you're using over there, as long as it's owned by the same person or the same entity. So if that were implemented in Colorado, it could potentially make solar viable for more LPA members. You think about it, if you're in a place, you know, your house is in a place where it's shaded, but you've got another piece of property somewhere that's nice and open, you can put the solar there. Um, <clears throat> There are also some net metering changes going on, and that's something that, you know, again, can affect what people, what drives people uh, <clears throat> to do behind the meter solar or not. And there's various state legislatures and PUCs that have made changes, so that's kind of, the, the point is that's in flux, and it's possible that the legislature here would do something else. Um, <clears throat> the wholesale electric marketplace, Again, regulation or legislation changes could encourage expansion of some of those markets, and I think Brett's going to talk some more about that later. And of course, storage and EVs, you know, how the regula government regulations would play into that. We're already having a discussion with Tri-State about Policy 115, you know, with batteries uh, on, you know, behind our, our main meter with Tri-State. 